Good afternoon. Welcome to Ron's Ramblings. This will be number 14, which is part 5 in the life of Noah. As we ended the last session, we were talking about verses 6 and 7 of Genesis chapter 1. And that's where God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And God divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. We discussed the meaning of the Hebrew word rakia, which means expanse or the space that's necessary to put everything that God created into. And Strong's view of that was that it meant the visible arch of the sky. And after we discussed the firmament in verse 6, where it is said to have been placed in the midst of the waters, we finally discussed the meaning of the word tavek, which is translated midst in verse 6. That meaning being to sever in half or to bisect. And the implication, to the Hebrew mind at least, was that the firmament would cut the waters in half, whereby an equal amount of water would be above the firmament, and the other half of the water would be below the firmament. And at this point, our minds probably began to, to lose focus, uh, because we begin to conjure up in our mind images that may be similar to several uh, images that I've had on the screen. Uh, this slide shows that in the top left, it's that stone wall that, that supported the waters above the firmament. Uh, and then over to the right is that uh, scientific view of the canopy that is shown there in that image of the Pangaea in the top right. But it also uh, may have been uh, something else. Uh, there is a new slide there, a new picture there on the bottom right of the spinning effect that many scientists have proposed. Uh, I don't think I mentioned that one because I really don't think it has any bearing on what we're talking about. But there is a new view that I want to show you. And it is one that is often considered, especially by creationists, uh, as to what that uh, might look like. Uh, this is a an image with some sort of a restraint whereby the waters remain uh, above the firmament uh, in that vacuum of outer space that you see. In, in this image, the, the firmament would extend from the, the bottom of that dark blue area at the top that is labeled waters above the firmament all the way down through the light blue area that is labeled the Earth's atmosphere and go down to the surface of the Earth. That, that whole distance from the surface of the Earth to the bottom of those uh, dark blue waters above the firmament would be considered to be the firmament. And uh, the firmament then, since we have not yet seen God create anything other than heaven and earth, and now in this second day he is modifying uh, the earth, the, the earth, that uh, indistinguishable mass of water. And so this is where we run into what I call a snag. And I, I, I say that because I think it has something uh, to do with the size of the firmament. We, we've already seen uh, the firmament is where God places all of the items that we see in the sky. In the last uh, rambling, we, we showed photographs that included the planets, the stars, the sun, the moon, comets, 
and everything else that's out there except those things that uh, are man-made. And we, we generally refer to that area as outer space. And if we're trying to consider that the waters above the firmament to be above or, or beyond outer space that, that the firmament uh, consists, uh, how far out there are we talking about? What is meant by the term above? We have a very difficult time, I think, in, in grasping just exactly what's going on here. Uh, we have no idea how far away uh, that water may have been from the surface of the earth. And, and the fact that we now have explorer satellites and, and ships that are traveling through space that have been sent out from the earth and are still reporting back after years and years and years of being up there and have traveled, uh, one of them at least, beyond the planet Pluto, which is the last planet in what we call our local solar system. So just how far out there would that be? And, and if the waters were that far away or further, because we don't have an idea of how, just how big that area is, then what kind of an impact would it have had on the earth? More than likely, in my guess, if we're talking about the waters being that far away, which we're talking of light years away, uh, it would be a negligible uh, effect, I think. So, even though in the early discussion of Noah, I alluded to a, a pre-flood world, I think we need to look a little deeper into that because the world then, I believe, was very, very different than the one we have today. Now, I realize that, that God has not yet created man. God has not yet created the stars and the moon and the sun. Uh, that's going to come uh, in the next day that we see. But considering the fact that up until Noah's lifetime, in fact, including the first uh, 600 years of Noah's life, uh, I talked to you about men that lived to be 800, 900 years old. And, and that indicates that the atmosphere or the the, the place where those people lived uh, obviously had a, a very long lifespan. It indicated that the atmosphere that God created in the very beginning was one that would essentially eliminate, well, maybe not eliminate, but greatly reduce the aging process. As a matter of fact, when God was creating everything, it was his intent that man would live forever. Remember, this is going on before man had been created, and therefore the sin has not yet entered into the world. So God still has in mind the idea that he would create man, and man would live forever uh, in paradise. And so... When he was creating everything, it was his intent to make the world be something that would allow the people to live forever and, and enjoy the things that he created. I have no idea what God's idea was in regard to uh, his plan of populating the earth. Uh, we know... Uh, for a certainty that God planned on Adam and Eve having children. Uh, and I'm assuming that he also planned for the animals to, to do the same. That, uh, but perhaps he had in mind a reduced number. You know, we spoke about the, 
the billions of people that, that lived on the earth at the time the flood came. Maybe it was God's plan that there would only be uh, a much fewer amount than that. I have no idea what that was. But as I said, we know for a certainty it was God's intent that Adam and Eve would have children and that their children would bear children and their children would bear children and so on because remember it is stated in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24 therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh if there's going to be marriages going on then there's going to be families being raised and so uh, we know for a certainty that after the sin of Adam and Eve, one of the consequences that applied to the women was that God multiplied their conception. Now, it doesn't say that he, he made it so they began to conceive, but rather he multiplied their conception, which indicates he ought Ready had put in place a plan for uh, the birth of, of children. He also multiplied their pain in childbearing be, because of the sin. But uh, it's my understanding of it that God intended for there to be families raised and people to populate the earth and enjoy the things that he had created. Uh, but as a consequence of sin, he altered his plan somewhat in order to allow those things to take place, to punish the people as well that, that were sinful, uh, and to carry on life. And it may have been at that point is when God decided there, was, there had to be some changes made. I just don't know. But of course, now the thing that we're looking at presently in chapter one of Genesis, well before man is created, well before sin entered into the world, then he is making a perfect place for a perfect uh, man and woman and their families to live, which I believe also includes animal life. There had to exist a, a friendly disposition between men, humans, and animals. Uh, remember, uh, all of the animals came to, to Adam so that Adam could name them. Uh, there's no indication, no evidence at all that there was any hostility between them. Because remember, God created a perfect world. Well, in regard to that atmosphere that had to support life and and reduce the aging process uh, scientists agree that at one time the earth the entire earth must have had a warmer uh, tropical environment and it must have had an enhanced oxygen level in the atmosphere that that allowed organisms to to grow and, and they grew larger uh, and more plentifully than they do today in our society. Some of them don't even still exist today. Uh, but even those that do, our modern counterparts or our modern uh, element of those things don't look like they did then. They're, as a general rule, much smaller, uh, not as healthy. Uh, there's, a, there's a place in Colorado where there is a terrifically big fossil bed, and scientists have dug into that fossil bed, and they have attributed the unusual things that they found to what must have been something like the water canopy that uh, the creation scientists believe existed. Uh, they, they found uh, 
animal fossils and plant fossils, even found some some fossilized trees that greatly exceeded any amount of growth uh, that they would have been if they were living under if they existed in today's society with the earth as, as it is today with the same number of rings in the trees uh, and so uh, Dr. Henry Morris one of the leading well I don't know if he's leading uh, he used to be recognized as one of the, the leading creation scientists. I made the following statement in a, a publication called Scientific Creationism in 1984. He wrote this, A vast blanket of invisible water vapor, translucent to the light of the stars, but productive of a marvelous greenhouse effect which maintained mild temperatures from pole to pole, thus preventing any air mass circulation, preventing any rain that would be the result of the air mass circulating, and it would have certainly had a further effect of efficiently filtering harmful radiation from space, markedly reducing the rate, he says, of mutations in living cells and as a consequence drastically re decreasing the rate at which humans aged and died. Even before Dr. Morris wrote that, uh, which I think was in 1984, yes, 1984, even before that, uh, Dr. Don Patton another creation scientist. He's a good friend of mine as well. And in the late 1970s, during a, a week-long stay in which he lived with Joanne and I, we discussed things uh, quite lengthily. And, and he mentioned that he believed that there was a greenhouse effect that would have existed due to the waters above the firmament. And if it did exist, as he thinks it did, he said it could have had a dramatically uh, increased atmospheric pressure on the surface of the early earth. And he said what that would do would contribute to a much healthier environment. It would be similar to living in a natural hyperbaric chamber. And I was able to see the difference between plants that have grown in a high uh, uh, hyperbaric chamber as opposed to being left outside of one. I've seen the evidence of piranha fish that have uh, spent their entire life inside a hyperbaric chamber and the exact same uh, fish part of them not put in the hyperbaric chamber but left in an aquarium just out in normal atmosphere it is surprising the difference that exists in those. One of the things I also find very interesting is that even though the scientists, uh, not the creation scientists, but the, the scientists who are strongly opposed to the subject of creation, have published articles that contain scientific material that tends to support the very things that we're talking about and that we think might have happened when God uh, created the waters and the earth and separated them uh, into the two halves. One relatively recent incident, I, I say recent, it happened in 1995, uh, stems from a, a team of international scientists that had gone to, to uh, South America and even into New Zealand and they were exploring the possibility of climatic changes and in Science Magazine, I don't remember which issue in 1995, uh, they wrote that they have determined that there was definitely climatic changes, both warming and cooling patterns during the late Pleistocene, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, 
period, and that they occurred rapidly and they were global in scale, which tends to support what we're talking about. But these men are not creation scientists, and they are trying to disprove creation with those very things that they thought. Anyway, uh, getting back on track, before I begin to talk about that scientific stuff, I said that the idea of half of the water being below the firmament and half of it being above the firmament caused what I call a snag because of just how far out or how far above the firmament was that water. And, and the size of the firmament being as big as it is, uh, literally an unknown uh, dimension because we have yet to send anything or see anything that has gone to the edge of it, uh, if there is an edge. Uh, just how far out there was the water and how much effect would it have had on the earth? Well, that verse that solves the problem is actually the very same verse that caused the problem. It's Genesis 1 and verse 7. And I have it on the screen. And you notice that it says that God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And the problem of understanding correctly this verse actually stems from two particular words that are used in the verse. And I suspect that you already recognize which two words uh, those are. It is the under and the above that we find in the verse. Our first, and I guess our natural uh, inclination would be to take those words literally. And, well, as an example, uh, below or under, uh, we, that the floor is under our feet. And we understand that. That's, that's, that's just the way it is. And the ceiling is above our heads. That's, that's literally using those words uh, to their meaning. However, even in our English language, we often alter the meaning of some words kind of automatically when we're not dealing with solid substances. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, I'm sure most of you have been swimming at one point or another in your life. When you dive under the water, are you not really in the water as opposed to being under the water? If you have a swimming pool, how are you going to get under the water? Dig under the pool? You see? And so we, what we're really saying is that we are below the surface of the water. We're not really under the water. We're under the surface of the water. Well, the Hebrews did the similar thing because they used two or more words sometimes to combine into a phrase uh, to illustrate the meaning that they really intended to get across. We discussed one of those, uh, I think it was in the last rambling, uh, where God divided the world. I, I think it was uh, verse 6 of, of Genesis 1 that we were talking about. And we said that uh, the English translation of the word divide did not adequately express what the actual Hebrew thought was. Uh, because the Hebrew thought actually consisted of two Hebrew words. Remember, we talked about the baudel and the bane, uh, which provided a distinction as well as a separation? Well, the same thing occurs here. When we're talking about above and under the water, the English word under is what the translators supplied for the Hebrew word uh, 
talk off, I guess, is the way to pronounce it. But the Hebrew thought consists not of just that one word, takoth, but rather it's a two-word phrase. And it doesn't exactly mean under. Nor does the English word that is translated above accurately express the Hebrew thought of the word above uh, in the Hebrew language. Uh, that word is A-L, I guess. Uh, it's, it's just simply spelled A-L. But I don't think they called it Al. I, I think it was A-L. So the Hebrew word that's translated in verse 7 as under is the Hebrew word takath. And it actually means bottom or beneath. Which is why the word is translated under, obviously. In the same manner, the Hebrew word eil means over or upon. But as I said, it's not just those words that exist because the Hebrew thought stems from a phrase that included those words, but it also includes the, the word mene or meni depending on how you pronounce it, which adds a different meaning or it alters the meaning of the original Hebrew word. The, the Hebrew word mene or meni uh, means among or in or by reason of. So the Hebrew expression, mene takoth, which adds the meaning among or in to the bottom or beneath, the meaning of the phrase becomes among and beneath. And that puts a whole new slant on this verse because it also applies to the word eil. Mene or meni, when added to the word eil, adds the among or in to the over or upon. And the meaning of that phrase becomes in and over. Just like the meaning of the phrase mene takath means among and beneath. Yes, the water has been bisected. It has been severed into two equal parts. But each part is also in or among the firmament, which allows the greenhouse effect that those scientists spoke of. Our time is gone again. Uh, we'll just take up here. We just about finished this particular a part, uh, and, but we'll begin here uh, in the next one. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a good afternoon.